In this recording, we're going to be looking at the conjugate subgroups of a normal subgroup, and we're going to be discovering a couple more important properties about normal subgroups. Uh, the first thing that I want to do is I want to actually look at uh, reviewing the definitions of conjugate subgroups and normal subgroups. So the first thing that I want to remember is that a subgroup H is said to be normal in G if and only if uh, each of the left cosets is equal to the corresponding right coset. In other words, GH is equal to HG, and this has to be true for every single element inside the whole group. The other thing that I want to uh, recall is that a conjugate subgroup is any subgroup that looks like G inverse times H times G. And uh, the other thing is, is it's, uh, is it's important to know that we have one of these guys. We have a conjugate subgroup for each G inside G, and uh, they may not be completely distinct from each other, but um, for any G and G, we can form one of these guys. So what I want to do is I want to actually look at what do the conjugate subgroups for a particular normal subgroup look like. So what do, what can we say rather, let's say that, what can we say about the conjugate subgroups of a normal subgroup. So what I want to think about is this. I'm going to start with um, looking at uh, a normal subgroup. So we're going to start with H is equal to a normal subgroup of G. And now what I want to do is I'm going to just let little g be an arbitrary element of capital G. And what I know is I know that, uh, let's see, the left coset is equal to the right coset. And um, that's because H is normal inside G. Now, I want to be thinking about what this actually means in set language. Uh, this left coset is nothing more than the set of GHs, where H is ranging over all of the elements of capital H. And the right coset, of course, is nothing more than um, all of the H's times little g, again, where the H's are ranging over all of the elements of H. Now, what I can do is I can multiply each and every element of both of these sets in turn by a particular element. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose to pre-multiply by G inverse. In other words, this particular, this particular set equation allows me to say that if I look at G inverse times this set, that's going to have to be G inverse times this set. Now, the notation, this notation here, means uh, what we want to do is we want to multiply every single element of the set, and the elements of that set look like this, by this particular element. And over on this side of the equation, um, the notation means that we're going to take each and every one of these elements and we're going to multiply it by uh, that G inverse. And it's got to be done on the same side because we don't know about commutativity. So when we do that, what that effectively means is that we can bring that G inverse into each of the set notations. So the set on the left becomes the set of G inverse G H's, where H is ranging over all of the elements of H. And this set on the right becomes the set of G inverse H G's, where H is ranging over all of the elements of H. Now let's look at what's going on here. In this set, G inverse times G is always known to be E. 
And so what that lets me do is that lets me say that on this side of the um, e equal sign, I'm really looking at just the set of objects that look like E times H, where H happens to belong to capital H. Over on the other side of my equality sign, I can't really do anything, so I'm just going to leave it as that set of symbols. Well, what I can do now is one more little thing. We've got the set of H's such that H is in H is equal to the set of G inverse H G such that H winds up being in our set H. Well, let's look at what that really is. This side here is really nothing more than a fancy, long-winded way of describing the set H. So on that left-hand side, what we've got is the set H is equal to. And if we look at the other side of our equation, the elements have the form G inverse times something in H times G. Well, that really is nothing more than the set G inverse times H times G by the definition of G inverse H times G. And so what we have found is that if I start with a normal subgroup named H, then it turns out that all of its conjugate subgroups just happen to be H itself. So this is what we've actually proved. And this is actually a fairly important property of normal subgroups, is that um, no matter what element in G you pick, you're going to have conjugation doesn't change the subgroup. In other words, uh, this statement here is going to be true for all G. So we really should say uh, then this guy is true for all G inside the group. Now, that means we can state this particular thing that we've just gotten done proving very formally as the following proposition. So what we've done is we have proved this proposition. If H is normal inside G, then the conjugate subgroup G inverse time, times H times G is always going to be equal to H for every single G inside our group G. Now, the thing that I want to look at next is something that mathematicians often do when they get a proposition proved. They, set the, they, they start asking themselves, is the converse of this proposition true? Well, let's see, what would the converse be? So the first thing that we need to do is we need to state the converse. So the statement of the converse is going to be, if we know that the conjugate subgroup for some particular subgroup is always equal to H, and that that's true for every single G inside G, then the subgroup that we start with would have to be normal. And so the question is, is this true? Well, we can investigate that in very much the same way we proved the first theorem. So let's start with our main hypothesis. So we start with assuming that H is some subgroup of G. We do not yet know whether or not it is normal. And we are going to assume that for every single G inside the group G, the conjugate subgroup is actually equal to the subgroup H. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start with that basic thing. We're just going to let G be any arbitrary element of G. 
And we know that g inverse h times g is equal to h by our main hypothesis. So now what I'm going to do is, again, I'm going to think about what do these th things actually mean. Well, this side is really nothing more than all of the g inverse times h times g's, where h is running over all of the elements of h. And I want to actually go ahead and rewrite that h in the long-winded form of saying that it is all of the symbols h such that h lives in h. Now, that's kind of a silly way of doing it, but you're going to see that it's going to be um, advantageous in just a second. Now, what I want to do again is simply say that once I have these two sets, I can pre-multiply each of the elements in both sets by a given element. And the element that I want to do the multiplying by is I want to pre-multiply by the element g. So we get g times this set had better be g times this set, since the two sets were equal to each other. Well, now I know how to handle g times a set. That's just going to be the set of g times the arbitrary element of this set. And the arbitrary element of this set is g inverse h times g. So the set on the left is g times g inverse h g's, where h is ranging over all of the elements of h. On the other side, uh, what we've simply got is the left coset for g times h. OK, well, let's see. Now what's going on? Well, let's see. Um, I'm going to say that partic this particular equation up here implies the next one. And that current equation is going to imply what? Well, let's get involved on looking at what's happening to these elements. G times G inverse over here is just an E. So the arbitrary element in this set on the left-hand side is just going to boil down to an EHG, where H is ranging over all of the elements of capital H. Over on this other side, this is the definition of the left coset G times H. So I'm going to write that as g times h by the definition of gh. Well, what goes on next? Well, that's pretty easy. This expression here, because e is the group identity, just boils down to an h times g. So the next equation that we have is that the set of hg's, where h is ranging over all the elements of h, is the same as g times capital H. But now let's finally look at this thing here. The set that we're looking at on the left-hand side of our equation is the definition of the right coset h times g. So we have one more step, and that's to recognize that we've got h times g on that side of the equal sign, and we have g times h on this side of the equal sign. And so what that says is that the left cosets equal the right cosets. In other words, what we've now got is that for every element in G, because we started with an arbitrary element in G, we actually do have H times G is equal to G times H. But that happens to be the definition of normal. So knowing this is enough to say that H is normal in G. Well, what that means is that we have now shown the following thing. So we have, if we know that every conjugate subgroup is equal to the original subgroup, 
then what we also know is that the subgroup in question winds up being normal. Now, if we put the two things together in this video, we get a very nice theorem. And the theorem says the following. Let H be a subgroup of G. H is normal in G if and only if the conjugate subgroup G inverse HG is always equal to H for every last element inside the group. And that will end this particular video.